Okay, so this next lecture was about torque, which, um, that's fine. And, uh, yeah, we sort of prefaced the lecture for torque with a bit of lever knowledge. And there's essentially three types of, le of levers, you know, type 1, type 2, type 3. And the types change depending depending on where your fulcrum is uh, and the direction of the forces that act on the lever sorry and uh, yeah they are actually important the three types but they're just something that anyone who is taking uh, principles of engineering might know and that that's a nice little familiar basis that will help you kind of understand this in a more intuitive manner, I hope. So, uh, yeah, torque. Well, simply torque, which we use this symbol to represent. I forgot how you pronounce this. With omega and alpha and all that, I wrote down how you pronounce it. It's from the Greek alphabet, obviously. Uh, pff, did not do the same with this, though. But that's okay, it doesn't matter much. We'll just call it torque. And uh, torque is actually just the tendency of an object to rotate. Tendency to rotate. That's all torque measures. Um, yeah, as for the equation for torque, let's imagine that on this lever, there's a force of 500 newtons acting upon it, and the distance from the fulcrum to that force is 2 meters. Uh, the equation for torque, or the torque of this force, is actually really simple. Its torque is equal to force which is perpendicular to the lever, which in this case it is. This right here would be a right triangle. And this uh, force vector is perpendicular to the beam here. So perpendicular force times distance. We'll call it T. I think they use, or lambda is occasionally used. Um, yeah, I like drawing my lambdas like this even though that's technically not a lambda. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'll draw it like that. That's just a D. No, ah, that's a music note. Huh. Um, no, it's in either one of those. It's irrelevant is what it is. I'll just keep it to a normal D. So, yeah. What the hell was it? Oh, God, now I don't remember how to draw it. Oh, boy, that is... <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, so that's, that's torque. That's the big thing. Whew. We're done. And, um, yeah, torque is just a vector product. Vector product. Ooh, boy, that is. Product. Uh, since this is a vector, right, force and distance has direction. Hopefully you have direction with your distance. Uh, yeah, which makes this a vector product. And uh, yeah, there's two directions. Well, no, sorry. Torque can rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, so CCW. CW. Now, when torque is that's torque is rotating in a counterclockwise direction, then torque is actually going to be positive. We say it's positive. It's an arbitrary uh, decision that was made. You know, counterclockwise is positive. Clockwise is negative. At least I believe it's arbitrary. If it isn't, then I don't know 
anything about it being otherwise we were not told. I digress, wow. Um, yeah, and then torque clockwise then is a torque equals negative. Um, aside for that, you have another right-hand rule for torque. And, um, yeah. To find the vector, which is you want your fingers to be in the direction of rotation. So imagine this right here is a finger. Okay, this is just like your pointer finger. It's pointing up, which obviously if it's rotating up just means that you keep going along this. This is currently counterclockwise, you see. And now when you have your fingers like this, with your right hand, mind you, you're also going to have your thumb right here as a result. Right? You know. Uh, since your thumb is pointing at you, it's just like the, um, back in our electromagnetism unit to find the direction of, I think it was in, uh, I don't, well, we'll say it's the direction of the electric field, since I don't remember, he just had a nail head, right? So if it was this, that means that it's going in to the wall, or, you know, just in, like, Imagine that this here is just a normal sheet of paper. It's going through that sheet of paper. And you just draw a smaller circle, like so, if it's going out. Because, you know, uh, a nail. Just a nail. That's kind of what it's like. That's how you get these different guys, symbols. And, uh, yeah, that's all there is. It's simple enough. Not too bad. Yeah, that's that's really most of it. From here on out, it's just seeing how it or this equation is applied. So this right here is mostly all that you need to write. I guess write the right hand rule as words instead of diagrams. Um Yeah. <laughs> so let's look at a few examples of how you would apply this. Let's say you have this system, you know? You can imagine there's like a beam here or a wall here holding it up. And this right here is our beam. And at the end of this beam, even though there's technically a wall, but I think you get the gist, we'll have a weight of five kilograms. And this angle right here would be 30 degrees. Also, one last thing, we should want this distance here, or the total length of the beam, to just be two meters. Now, how would we find the torque? Well, what are the forces acting upon this beam? There is this uh, gravitational force acting, and the beam will say is massless for now, so we don't deal with that quite yet. So we have a force, and it's 2 meters, so we have a distance. So do we just multiply 5 by 9.8 to get newtons for the gravitational force times the distance? Uh, and the answer is no. I think this was a huge hint, I'm drawing that, that it's not. Because this force right here is not perpendicular to the beam, right? It's got an angle, and that angle is actually, this is a right angle, supplementary angle, this would be a total of 90 degrees, 30, or 90 minus 30 is 60, and that means that this, again, 90 minus 60, has to be 30. So what you actually need to do is find the force which would be perpendicular, right? We can just go ahead and draw this real quick. You know, this is 60, and since it's perpendicular, this has to be a 90 degree angle, although I obviously didn't draw it properly. And that's 60, right? So we want to find this force. Uh, we know this right here, our hypotenuse, our hypotenuse is 5 
we'll just run 9.8 to 10, 50 newtons. I don't want to get a calculator. Well, then to find this force, it's just sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, right? We have our hypotenuse, we're trying to find the opposite, and we know what the angle of sine would be. So sine of 60 equals opposite over 50. Mm, I won't call it opposite, I'll call it force perpendicular. Just because my opposite just looks like a zero and that's not as fun, over 50. So our perpendicular force would actually be 50 times sine of 30. Which is nice, that's simple enough. And to find the actual torque, we'd simply multiply two, again the length, this entire thing is 2, by uh, perpendicular force, by 50, by sine of 30. And that would give us our torque. The units for torque, I neglected to mention, I apologize, is Newton meters, right? Because you have Newton meters, you just multiply them, simple enough. And, uh, yeah. Oh, it should also be mentioned that torque is kind of like force, where the net torque would just be the sum of all the torques acting upon a object or a system. And yeah, that should be most of it. Uh, yeah, now let's pretend that our beam is not massless like it is here. And that would be a bit more difficult. So to start with, we'll just envision a lever without any angles. We'll say this beam right here, B, and it has a mass, we'll say, of uniform density. And, uh, pfft, Whoa, words are escaping. And its mass is, let's say, 10 kilograms. And uh, yeah, so if you remember the equation for the center of mass is equal to the mass of the object at some point i, right? Times. Uh, yeah, times the effective distance that object, if it was only one object, would have from one end of the end, so one end of whatever it's on. So let's just say you have some object like this, right, and you just have the mass here. It would be whatever this mass is times this distance. And then you have to do that distance over two because that's how it would be the center of mass, right? So this is what that represents, the technical center of mass that would belong to just that object, which is the total distance again over two. Um, and yeah, just that for as many sums as you have all over, all over uh, the total mass, right? So let's say you have three objects, one of mass five, one of mass 10 kilograms, and the other of two kilograms. This is the sum of all those masses, which if this was the case, would just be 10 plus two is 12, 12 plus five is 17, 17 is what this would be. And uh, yeah, I want to use this analogy again, this right here, this top portion would be five times that distance, again, as I mentioned, from one end to that point five over two, and all that good stuff. That would repeat for 10, and that would repeat for two. And that's how you find the center mass. Now, if you have a beam like this, with a uniform density, so that means that each point has the same mass, um, and you were to add all those masses up and multiply them by the total distance of the beam over two, or, you know, whatever you do, you would actually find that the center of mass ends up exactly in the middle of that beam, which in the case where 
So I know, I'll leave that for a bit. So yeah, it would just be in the center of the middle of the beam. Which means that you could rewrite that beam of certain mass as just a massless beam with another weight equivalent to that mass of the beam in its center. Uh, now if you get non-uniform mass, it usually tells you where the center mass is located then, like a non-uniform beam of mass 10 kilograms, which is, let's say this is 2 meters in total, which is 1.74 meters from the pivot point or the fulcrum. That didn't work. Shh. Now I need to know, guys. This too it was actually a six. So yeah, this would be a three technically, and then non-uniform. And I said what 1.2 meters. So then the center of mass, this thing that you would draw usually in the middle, you just draw 1.2 meters from the fulcrum. And proceed like it's a massless beam from there with this additional weight and yeah that's uh, that's how you do it <laughs> so let's pack this real quick let's say we have a uniform beam yeah mass equals 10 all that good stuff uh, we'll put another weight on it over here we'll say this is five kilograms and we'll say the total distance of the beam is two meters, with this being halfway point. And um, we'll say we have another block here of unknown mass. But we'll say that the net torque, or sorry, we'll say that the system is in rotational equilibrium. And what that means is that uh, the beam is not moving. It's just how, with forces, you have translational equilibrium, where it's not moving like any side, you know, just not moving, stays in place, fixed. Rotational equilibrium just means that it's not rotating, it's fixed at one point, or not at one point, but, you know, fixed as a line, I guess, as non-rotating. It's kind of like um, how you can manipulate graphs, right? You have translational manipulation where you take a curve and you just add or subtract x and y to move it to another place. Or again, you have rotational manipulation instead. I don't think it's called rotational manipulation actually, but whatever, you have a curve and then you say reflect it over the y-axis. And then it rotated. It's kind of the same concept. And when you say it's in rotational equilibrium, that means that it can't be reflected over an axis or over a line. And when you say it's in translational equilibrium, that means that you can't add anything to x and y to move it, uh, just like so. So yeah, Norknet e Nork <laughs> Torknet equals zero because rotational equilibrium. So we want to find this mass of this block here. We'll call it block one, which makes this mass one. Well, how do we go about this? We know that the net torque is zero, but we also know that net torque is the sum of all the torques, kind of like in forces. So we know that this zero is actually equal to uh, the torque provided by this block which is block two, we'll say, plus the torque provided by this block, which is block one. And again, since this beam has mass, we also need to find the torque provided by the beam. So torque beam, I'll say BE. All right, so Again, for the weight of the beam, we know that we can just, since it's uniform, write it exactly at the center of the beam as just another block and then proceed as if it's a massless beam like we did up here. So that the beam is 10 kilograms. Well, torque is perpendicular force. Times distance from the fulcrum.
So, in the case of block 1, torque is just the mass, which we don't know, times the distance, which is just 1 meter, because it's 2 meters long, half of that is 1 meter. What did I just say? No, yeah, that makes sense, sorry. Um, because that's where the fulcrum is, exactly at the midway point. For, oh, whoopsie daisy. Now we just pretend that this is a one and this is a two. Nope. Yeah, so all that stuff. For the second block, we know that um, the torque is the force. Oh, sorry, I forgot to multiply this by 0.8 find the force that's my bad and again we could just for each of these we could draw a free body diagram right and the only force acting upon it is gravity which is already perpendicular to our beam because it's perfectly i want to say sideways that's not the word but it's 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 at a same angle as the ground which is always going to be at a right angle for gravity And yeah, that means that we could just plug in our gravity for that. So 9.8 times the mass times 1 meter plus the second block is again 9.8 times the mass, except this time we know the mass to be 5 kilograms times the distance, which is once again 1 meter. And then our beam's torque, which is gravity times the mass. Except this time, the distance is zero, right? Because it's right on top of the falcon, fulcrum point. Since they're both set to be at the exact midpoint of the beam. So this is just zero. Well, then if we... Oh, and it also equals zero, as I mentioned here. If we simplify this expression, all right, we find that we could... Subtract or divide 9.8 from both sides. And you have mass 1 times 1 meter is equal to negative 5 newton meters. You divide both sides by 1 meter and you get mass 1. This is actually kilogram meters since I canceled out gravity. You get mass 1 is equal to negative 5 kilograms uh, oh boy <laughs> I realized yeah there's a problem here obviously mass is negative what is the cause of that problem well the answer is simple this beam would make or this weight would make the beam rotate this way which is clockwise Whereas this beam will make the, no, this weight would make the beam rotate this way, which is counterclockwise. And since, if you remember, we said that clockwise is uh, negative and counterclockwise is positive, we need to give each of these beams their respective sign, which I neglected to do here. So let's go through. This would then be actually minus, which means that when we move it to the other side, it ends up being a plus. And that means plus is here too, and you divide by one, and yeah, it's equal to positive five kilograms. That's my fault. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's more or less it. We just apply these concepts, whether there's a difference in angle, a difference in mass, uh, the beam has weight or not, and the beam has got a perfect density or not, you could just apply all the concepts here, and you're good. Just all that stuff. Let's do two quick practice problems. Oh wow, my page is really small. There's a bit of an empty spot, space. And, uh, yeah, let's start with the worksheet that I got, question 1D. 
it gives you a wall. It's lopsided. Wait, I can't make it that straight. Do we that, can I? It gives you a wall. Oh god, it looks horrible. Whatever. A wall. It has a beam on it. And it tells you that the B equals 10 meters long. Right? And then this beam is held at some certain angle by a cable that's right here, which is connected to the wall. And the angle this cable makes of the wall is 73 degrees. Uh, now, I feel like right off the bat, a lot of people see this degree sign and they think, well, okay, I just need to plug in cosine or sine. Oh, before we get started, I, there's other, it also has a ball of a mass which is equal to. Okay, um, yeah, this mass is actually just zero kilograms, so we can just not draw it. Weird. Uh, but yeah, besides all this information, it tells you this right here is the pivot point, which makes it the fulcrum. Uh, it tells you the force of the cable is 570 newtons, acting this way, obviously, as the cable would. And it tells you the distance here, from the tip of the uh, beam to where the cable is attached to it, is 1.4 meters and it wants you to find the perpendicular force and the torque so let's start with the perpendicular force this system has two forces acting upon it right it has the force of the cable and it has the force of gravity since the beam is not massless I mentioned that. <gasps> Whoopsie daisy. The beam is massless. I'll redo that. Uh, this system has one force acting upon it. Since the beam is massless, it just has the force of the cable acting upon it. And that tells us that the perpendicular force is equal to the perpendicular force of the cable. Now, how do we know if this is perpendicular to this? Because I could have drawn it wrong. <clears throat> Sorry, I could have drawn it wrong, right? Um, but we're also given that this was 25 degrees, which I, again, forgot to mention. This is just not going well. Well, okay, we know all this. So we know that this would usually be 90 degrees right here, right? Which means that this angle is equal to 90 minus 25 degrees, which is 65 degrees. And we also know that in total, a triangle has 180 degrees. So this angle here has to be 180 minus 73 plus 65, which is equal to 42. So this angle here is 42 degrees. Now, if we want it to be perpendicular with the beam, it has to be at a 90 degree angle with it, which this is evidently not, right? It's 42. Um, so then that kind of warns us that we need to find what this angle is so we could have our little triangle right this would again right this would be uh, parallel to this that's actually not a parallel sign but you get the gist and then you'd have a right triangle, because these are supposed to be perpendicular, right? That's the entire point. And with it, you'd have the hypotenuse equal to this cable. 
and you'd have this perpendicular distance, which you're trying to find, perpendicular force. Well, this angle, since in total it should be 90 degrees with the beam, is equal to 90 minus 42, which is equal to 48. So this angle is 48. That means that we want the, th the side that is adjacent to the angle in the hypotenuse, and that function we'd use then is cosine of 42 is equal to uh, the adjacent, which I'll call the perpendicular force of the cable, since that's what it is when we're trying to find, over the hypotenuse, which is the force of the cable, which is also 570 newtons. Therefore, our perpendicular force of the cable would be equal to cosine of 42. Oh, not 42. I apologize. This was supposed to be a 48, as we've agreed over here. So cosine of 48 times 570 newtons, which is in turn equal to 381.4 newtons. And that's our perpendicular force. Now, to find the torque, we also need to find the length of where the over that perpendicular force is acting from the pivot point. We know that the total distance of the beam is 10 meters and that from the tip of the beam to where it's acting is only 1.4 meters. This just looks horrendous. I... Oh, wait, no, it doesn't because this is the 1.4. Radio. Uh, so yeah, all we need to do is subtract 10 by 1.4, right? By this portion here, we don't want that to find the distance from here to here. That distance is then 10 minus 1.4, 8.6, right? Is that right? Yeah, it is right. 8.6. So we just multiply 8.6 by 381.4 newtons to find our torque. And that is equal to 3,280 newton meters. And, um, I said I wanted to go over a second problem, but now that I'm looking at it, it seems simple enough that I don't think I need to go over the entire thing. I'll go over portion A. All right. Uh, this is problem 7A, and it gives you this. What's it give you? It gives you a little diagram here. This is the beam. Uh, this is a wall. It's got cable acting upon it. The beam is not massless. Uh, it tells you that the beam equals uniform. And it weighs I just can't spell. And it weighs 500 newtons, the exact words. And it is supported by the cable, as shown. And, um... Hmm, does it give you anything else? Oh, it gives you that this is 35 degrees. that this is 1.6 degrees, or degrees, meters, and that the beam is also equal to, or is also four meters long. And, um, oh, it tells you this is the right angle. Aside from all that, uh, let's, oh, it's in stat, stat equilibrium. Yeah, it's in rotational equilibrium. So, torque net equals zero. And it asks you to find the tension in the beam, or in the string, or whatever it is, cable that is holding the beam up. Now, since this is a uniform beam with a mass of 500, we know that, oh, and since it's four meters long, we know that it, we could just write it as a massless beam with a weight exactly in the middle, 
which would be two meters in and that that weight is equal to the total weight of the beam which is 500 newtons so make sure that you gotta make sure you differentiate between newtons and kilograms uh, because kilograms is not force you have to multiply it by gravity and other stuff and you have to know other stuff no you <laughs> yeah to find fg you have to multiply it by gravity so yeah, this is in newtons now Since the net torque is equal to zero, and it's also going to be equal to the sum of the torques, that means it's going to be equal to the torque of the cable in addition to the torque of the beam itself. Now, pivots about this point is also a thing to be telling. We can rewrite this as zero equals torque of the beam which is just two meters times and this is already perpendicular to the beam so times 500 newtons plus actually uh, one of these is minus it doesn't actually matter which one we say is minus when there's only two of them but for the sake of being correct, we should mention that the clockwise one would be negative, which makes this one negative because it's going this way, right? Clockwise. Um, so this is actually negative. In fact, I'll just do it like this. So that's a negative number plus the torque of the cable. Now the cable is not, or the force provided by the cable is not perpendicular to the beam, so we need to once again find what the perpendicular would be. Well, this is not too difficult. Again, any triangle would have 180 degrees total. We already know one of this side, or one of these angles is 35 and the other is 90, so 180 minus 35 plus 90 would be this angle here. And that number is then equal to 55. We know that this makes a right angle with this. So we know that 90 should be equal to whatever this angle is, minus or plus 55, which tells us that this angle here is equal to 35 degrees. <sighs> now again, this is parallel to this right angle. You have a triangle, perfect. We have a right triangle, which is easy. Cosine, this is adjacent to our angle. Hypotenuse, this is opposite to the right angle. So you'd use cosine of 35 is equal to the perpendicular force that we're trying to find over uh, this here hypotenuse force, which we said was 500 newtons. What did we say it was? Cables shown. Oh. Sorry, yeah, by the force of the cable, which we don't know. Um, so if we can find out what our perpendicular force is using this equation, zero equals two meters times five, or times negative 500 newtons. This is our beam, right? And now the torque of our Cable would just be 1.6 meters. It gave us the distance, remember, right here. 1.6 meters times the force, the perpendicular force of the cable, which if we just isolate perpendicular force of the cable, we understand that it is equal to 625 newtons.
So this equation can now use that value that we calculated just now, and we have cosine of 35 is equal to the perpendicular force, aka the cable, which is also known as 625 newtons, over the actual force of the cable, which is the tension of the cable technically. So we just isolate f of c by multiplying here and dividing the cosine, and you get that f of c is equal to 762.98 newtons. And there we go. That's your answer. Uh, the next portion is just add a weight to the end, which you know how to deal with, and then they change the weight of stuff, I think. Right? And yeah. That's that's that. Sorry, I'm a bit tired. Yeah, thanks. Hope it helps. Adios.